the next Petman Academy musicianship class. So last time we talked about the piano and the development of that instrument through the first half of the 19th century, mostly. And we looked at some very important 19th century composers, including Mendelssohn, Chopin, Schumann, and Liszt. So today I'm going to start in the 19th century again, but towards the, the end of the 19th century, the second half of that century, in fact. And I'm going to start with a composer called Richard Wagner, who many of you, I'm sure, will have heard of at the very least, even if you're not completely familiar with all of his music. And then we're going to look at ways that approaches to comp musical composition developed um, in the early part of the 20th century and the influence that Wagner had on composers such as Debussy and Stravinsky. So that's the plan for today. So I'm just going to share my screen with you right now. Um, just bear with me. And then I'll start the slideshow. So Wagner, um, Wagner was a, was a real mover and shaker in the world of opera. Um, and he's a man whose music inspires fanatical devotion in some and profound loathing in others. And he was and still is very much a controversial figure. So I'm not going to spend lots of time today talking about all of Wagner's operas. Um, they're quite complicated and very difficult to understand. We might well study them at a later date, perhaps when we resume in-person classes. Um, but I would like to focus on a couple of aspects um, of his musical operatic compositions. Um, Wagner was kind of both a thoroughly despicable person, but also a complete genius. And above all else, he was a man of theatre. And everything that he did was theatrical, whether it was his own biography, his personality, his beliefs, his prose writing, his compositions. Everything was over the top. And he even fought at one point in his life for revolution. In 1849, he had to flee for his life from Germany to Switzerland, as he'd been involved in the Dresden Uprising. And for this, he needed a new identity and a fake passport that was provided for him by his friend, the generous composer and performer Ferenc Liszt. And he remained in exile in Switzerland for 12 years. We know almost um, more about Wagner than any other composers. He wrote lots and lots of books, articles um, about music and about himself. Um, and he left us with a lengthy autobiography and some 10,000 letters. So he's very much a composer that arouses a lot of interest and fascination. A lot of the stories that Wagner uses for his opera um, comes from old myths and legends. Not Greek, ancient Greek, um, like we see in Baroque opera, but Germanic, Celtic, Norse and Christian myths. Um, and some examples of this, there's a picture of Wagner, by the way. Some of the examples of this are um, Tannhäuser and Lohengrin. Tannhäuser was premiered in 1845 in Dresden. And Wagner went on tinkering and playing around with this opera until the year of his death. And it was never really completed in his view. Lohengrin was completed in 1848, but because of the Dresden Uprising in 1849, the first performance took place in Weimar in 1850, but with Ferenc Liszt conducting. And Lohengrin became the most popular of Wagner's operas in the 19th century. Um, and it's from there that comes the very famous Bridal March, which I'm sure you all have heard of. Today I want to spend a bit of time talking about one of his most influential operas, and that is Tristan und Isolde, which was um, premiered in 1859. And Wagner created a special harmonic sequence that represents the love between these two characters, Tristan and Isolde. Um, and this little passage of music fills the entire opera, and it's constantly referred to. This is what it sounded like.
So you might say, well, so what? And to our ears, our modern ears today, that sounds okay. But to the ears of people at this time, it was one of the most daring harmonic progressions imaginable. The first chord is highly dissonant, but that's not really the problem. Western music up until this point had been full of dissonance, but it was released. In fact, released in rather structured ways. When I say release a dissonance or resolve a dissonance, I mean that a clash of notes that don't really sound like they belong together is undone, so that you end up on a comfortable, nice-sounded, well-rounded chord without any clashes in it. For instance, this is how Beethoven starts his first symphony, on a chord with a dissonance in it, by comparison a fairly modest dissonance, and this is then released onto the next chord. So this is what Beethoven does, in his first symphony. What this dissonance or clashes of notes um, does is provide restless movement that always wants to resolve. What Wagner did that was so daring and new was to allow these clashes to just sit there without resolving or to resolve them in unorthodox ways. Here's what another composer might have done with that Tristan chord. Now there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but Wagner's solution was very different and for the time, incredibly daring. He took the music in unexpected directions after that chord. If you were a massive fan of Wagner, you went around singing this little phrase to yourself and to others, and if you weren't, you hated it. Probably more has been said about this one chord than any other chord in the entirety of music history. In the next few classes, we're going to see how almost everything that came next in the history of Western music could, in some way or other, be related to this Tristan chord. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that after Europe had first heard that chord, it was no longer really necessary to observe sort of hierarchies and rules of keys and preordained structures that were set out by established key relationships. In short, Composers from this point onwards could use whatever notes they wanted. It didn't happen overnight, of course, but not all that long after Wagner. That's exactly what happened, as we're going to see shortly. So let's listen then to the opening of um, the prelude to Tristan und Isolde, and try to listen out for the way that the music seems to meander through all sorts of different keys, without being concerned about establishing a single home key.
Because music now no longer needed to be in a key. By that I mean like in C major or B flat major or D minor. This meant that it could meander in all sorts of directions without needing to stay in that home key. The sinuous melodies that we've just heard seem to go on and on forever, or at least to be able to go on forever. And that's because there's nothing anchoring them to a specific home key. Think back to what we looked at a few classes ago with the Mozart examples and even the Beethoven examples as well. This also meant that composers could experiment with finding harmonies, especially these dissonant clashing harmonies that didn't so much serve a particular function within a key as simply offer an interesting or dramatic colour, which could be used to very expressive effect. Now the music theory behind all of this may sound a bit technical, but the most important thing I want you to try and recognise is that the way Wagner did unorthodox things with harmony opened doors to whole new worlds of musical expression. So that moves me on to the question um, in the early 20th century that many composers had, and that was what to do after Wagner, where to take music after what Wagner did with that Tristan chord. When someone had drawn out the possibilities of using dissonance for expressive purposes to such an extent as Wagner had done, what else can you do that doesn't sound like a copy or sound pale in comparison? So this question of what to do after Wagner was a real difficulty for some composers. Some continued in the same direction as Wagner had done, while others set out in new directions. And one of the latter was this man here, Claude Debussy. Debussy once described Wagner as a glorious sunset mistaken for dawn. So you remember that Tristan chord um, and its unusual method of resolving. It was a dissonant chord that didn't resolve onto a nice, comfortable, stable chord, but moved on to another dissonance. Well, Debussy took the next step and said that perhaps it doesn't even need to resolve at all. Perhaps these dissonant sounds can just sit there hanging. In Debussy's view, there could be beauty and imagery in these dissonant chords. Here's a simple example from a piece of piano music called The Little Shepherd. Um, incidentally, this comes from a collection of piano pieces called Children's Corner, and the next piece in the set is titled Gollywog's Cakewalk, which begins like this, and some of you, if you've played piano, might well recognise it. Um, and later on, he actually takes a little swipe at Wagner's notorious Tristan melody. See if you can pick that out here. Debussy's music, in fact, contains so much of this dissonance that somehow these dissonance, um, dissonances seem to be less important and our ears enjoy the sounds as they merge from one to the next. Debussy was criticised by his teachers at the Paris Conservatoire for writing harmonies that didn't resolve and move correctly, but to Debussy what mattered was not the old-fashioned rules of harmony, but simply whether or not he liked the sounds. 
Um, Debussy and his contemporary Maurice Ravel, both French, were composers that we refer to as Impressionist. This term was taken from the Impressionist painters such as Renoir and Monet, and there are some ways in which the music is like that. So take a look at this example by Renoir. Um, Impressionist painters were often more interested in the way that light fell on things rather than on the objects themselves, as we can see here. So little subtle shades of colour and a blurred sort of effect is more important than the actual image themselves. Here's another example by Monet. And Debussy's music, too, um, often seems like light falling on objects, and we see them smudged a little bit. Just like here, Monet painted the same cathedral, the cathedral in Rouen, um, several times, each under different light conditions. And so Debussy, in his piece called Prelude à la Prémédie d'un Faune, um, begins with a melody that's played by a solo flute. And we hear the melody actually three more times. And each time it's accompanied by different harmonies in the orchestra. So have a listen to this. It's fascinating how this piece, perhaps more so than the piano piece that we just listened to, manages to hover in space with very little harmonic pattern to it. Remember that a key such as C major, D minor, etc., gives a sense of direction to a piece of music, and Debussy largely avoids that here. Debussy also wrote a set of piano pieces um, that he called preludes. Interestingly, his preludes for the piano 
all have titles, but not at the beginning of the piece, as you might expect, but at the end. So it's almost as if Debussy is saying that once you've heard music, you can find out what it was all about. Or perhaps he's saying it's not vital to know the title, just simply enjoy the music for its own sake. In any case, it's not an explicit depiction like in some program music, but more a subtle impression. That would be quite a good way of describing it. Um, and I do urge all the pianists um, amongst us to have a go at listening to and playing La Cathedrale Englouti, or The Sunken Cathedral in English, if you haven't done so already. It's a really beautiful piece of music and captures a lot of the ideas of Impressionism that I've just spoken about. Despite his unconventional approach to harmony, Debussy can't avoid tonality and some sort of key system altogether. And most of his music does have a sense of belonging in some sort of key. It's just far less obvious than in earlier composers. That was to disappear completely in something that we will call atonality that I'll refer to in a couple of classes time. But traditional tonality also had no part to play in much of the music of Igor Stravinsky. Stravinsky was one of the most creative minds of the 20th century, and although he learnt much from the music of Debussy and Ravel, he found many new ways ahead for music, and I want to explore some of them today and in next time's session. Stravinsky produced an incredible variety of music and worked in almost all um, avenues of the um, compositional field, if you like. He's probably um, best known today for his early works that were commissioned by the Russian ballet director, Sergei Diaghilev, for performances by the Russian ballet in Paris. Now the word ballet may conjure up images of tutus, tights and tiaras, um, like you might see in a ballet with music by Tchaikovsky, for instance, Sleeping Beauty, The Nutcracker or Swan Lake. But it doesn't just have to mean that. Ballet has a long history, especially in France and in Russia, and styles have varied across the centuries. And Diaghilev's choreography was every bit as contemporary and daring as Stravinsky's music. In 1910, Stravinsky wrote The Firebird, which he followed up with Petrushka the following year. And these are two fabulous works, often played now in concert form without any dancing at all. And I do urge you, if you have time, to check them out. These ballets have a distinct Russian character because they at times employ some Russian folk tunes and also scales that come from Russian folk music. However, Stravinsky puts his own mark on them through his use of dissonance, clashing notes um, and also unpredictable rhythms. He also makes use of some innovative choices of instruments in the orchestra that produce some unusual colours or timbres, which is the um, technical musical term. So let's have a listen to this excerpt from Petrushka. You can hear the sounds of the xylophone, a muted trumpet, a piano, which of course had never been an orchestral instrument, and also all sorts of alternation between different groups or single instruments. So let's have a listen to this. <laughs>
Now, to illustrate what I said about unpredictable rhythms, here's the opening of Petrushka. You'll find here that if you try to tap your foot along to the pulse of the piece, you'll get hopelessly confused because Stravinsky is constantly changing the regular pulse, or in technical jargon, he's constantly changing the time signature. And it all gives a fantastically busy feeling to the piece with occasional moments of calm when the beat stays constant for a while. So have a listen to the opening of Petrushka. And now, just to give you a little taste of the Firebird, have a listen to the lurking menace Stravinsky creates through interesting sound effects in the strings. He gets them to play what we call tremolo, which means very fast, a bit like the chattering of teeth on a cold day. And he also asks them to play on a part of the instrument that produces a scratchy, unpleasant sound. So here's a little excerpt from the Firebird. So that's quite a nice, comfortable place for us to stop this class. It's a little bit of a um, shorter session than previous ones. Um, next time, we're going to move on and look at perhaps Stravinsky's most famous and most influential work, um, which is his ballet, The Rite of Spring. So we're going to, that's where we're going to kick off next time. And we're going to continue this journey about the various directions that composers took um, following Wagner's inspirational, in, innovative Tristan chord um, back in 1859. So I'll see you again digitally next time and I wish you um, a great rest of the week. Thank you very much and bye-bye.